So today's lecture is going to deal with flexibility and flexibility training. And before we really get into flexibility, what we want to identify is flexibility does not equate to stretching. So this is actually not what we are talking about. Uh, the figure here that you can see shows the amount of muscle stretch from a large amount of uh, a small amount of muscle stretch to a large amount of muscle stretch and the change in shape and size of the connected tissue and so you can see that uh, a small amount of stretch so fibers um, as they're lengthened by shortening they uh, are i'm sorry as the fibers lengthen by straightening rather uh, you have a small amount of change, very, very small amount of change in, in size of the connective tissue. And then as the fibers begin to stretch or they begin to extend in length, you can see that that's where we begin to increase the size and the shape of that, uh, of that tissue. Uh, then there's a point where the fibers will become, become brittle and they'll also rupture. So if we can actually extend this portion of the curve, and extend this portion of the curve before we begin to move into this uh, portion where we have injury and, and, and rupture, that's going to be a good thing. And that's what flexibility training is going to accomplish for us. So it's not, it's not stretching so much as it's flexibility is the ability of a given joint to go through or to move through range of motion, the RON, that equals range of motion. Now when we look at the ability of a joint to go through its range of motion, range of motion occurs in two ways. Either as a static range of motion, and so how far can a joint go and be held in one position versus dynamic range of motion. And an individual's dynamic range of motion is this characteristic of the joint's movement, not in that one position, but through its range of motion. So how are the static and the dynamic ranges of motion actually determined? And how do we determine higher ranges of motion for individuals that we say have higher levels of flexibility versus individuals with smaller ranges of motion that have lower flexibility? So the determinants are going to include things like joint structure. What are the directions of movement for a particular joint? Sometimes referred to not as the range of motion, but as the range of movement. What are the ranges and directions the joint structure allows that joint to go? The determinant also will include the joint capsule, which is this anatomical structure that helps to encase or encapsulate a joint. And the tissue that's found in a joint capsule is semi-elastic. So there is some degree of movement and flexibility, but um, for the most part, the joint capsule is protective and prevents unwanted movements. It also further provides strength and stability for the joint and keeps movement within an acceptable range. So it reduces movement to prevent unwanted, unwanted movement outside of normal operation of the joint. A third determinant is the muscle's elasticity. And 
invincibility to flame tip. So individuals who have a higher level of flexibility, we're going to find have different joint structures, uh, more elastic joint capsules, and more elastic muscles. Now, most of you would think that probably the muscle is what helps to determine and regulate the joint's flexibility, but it's actually going to be the nervous system. So it's the nervous system that helps to regulate flexibility. And what we find is in our muscles near our joints, we have tissues called stretch receptors. And these stretch receptors are going to provide information back to the central nervous system to help control muscle length. And this is a, a very protective mechanism. It's a protecting mechanism in the sense that if a muscle stretches too far, so if we have a muscle that's stretched and it goes beyond its range of movement, it can be deleterious and destructive to that muscle. So the receptors exist to send a message back to the spinal cord, which is part of the central nervous system. And that information that's sent back to the spinal cord, spinal cord, is going to be evaluated. And if it's determined that that muscle is stretching beyond its capacity, the spinal cord sends a signal back to the muscle to cause the muscle to contract and to oppose the stretch. Now, in the case where the central nervous system determines that the muscle might be damaged, it signals for a strong muscle contraction to occur. And this is opposite, is an opposite reflex to cause relaxation. So the nervous system is actually going to regulate how far a muscle can stretch and regulates the flexibility of the muscle. So basically the muscle fibers, as they begin to stretch, they begin to move in towards this portion of the curve, which is a very large amount of muscle stretch. The nervous system determines this to be deleterious for the muscle and causes it to contract, which sends it back down towards this portion of the curve to protect it from eventually rupture. So what are the benefits of flexibility training? So the benefits of flexibility and training include improved joint health, Prevention of lower back pain. And lower back injury. Some other potential benefits. May include Temporary reduction of post-exercise muscle soreness.
also called DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness. So a flexibility training program can have temporary effects and reduce that muscle soreness after exercise. It may provide relief of general aches and pains and reduce the incidence of muscle cramps. has the potential to improve body position. Posture can have advantageous effects on strength specific for sports. May maintain or help in the maintenance Good posture, balance, and may also increase relax relaxation. So help an individual in a psychological term to relax and to have the benefits of being in a relaxed state. Flexibility training might also have some benefits on lifetime wellness. This uh, idea that you can age more gracefully and that you'll be resistant to injury later in life. Okay, just like we've done with kind of respiratory endurance training, muscle strength and muscle endurance training, how do we tap into the benefits of flexibility training? And again, we're going to use the FIT principle for flexibility training. Now, when you look at a flexibility training program, the FIT principle is applied as follows. Frequency again will be not how often to stretch, because that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about how often to engage or train the flexibility. When we look at intensity, Intensity is how far to go through range of motion. The timing for flexibility training will be how long to hold your extended range of motion. Type sorry, not stretching which flexibility rather, which flexibility exercises to perform. meant to say here when I wrote down stretching is that, again, we're talking about flexibility training, we're not talking about stretching. So the exercises may be things like moving your, uh, your uh, joints through a range of motion using a, a side lunge or an inner thigh, what they call stretch, I would call exercise. So moving the joint through those full ranges of motion in a way that optimizes neuromuscular integration but reduces the chances of injury that are common with stretchy activities. So let's talk about frequency, specific recommendations. Again, American College of Sports Medicine 
recommends two to three days per week. And we want to go through the exercise, the flexibility exercise. Flexibility exercise when the muscle is warm. You may also want to use a flexibility exercise after a workout. After a workout. After an active warm up. And what we want to do is avoid classical stretching. Because this increases the risk of injury. And when I say stretching, I'm talking about just simply moving through that range of motion. In order to feel the muscle begin to induce some discomfort or even pain. So we want to avoid that because that discomfort and that pain is actually destruction to the muscle tissue. You have an increase in, in tearing of the muscle tissue, breakdown of that muscle tissue. So you're inducing injury which weakens the muscle. And so when you go to use that muscle, whether it be for exercise or sports, you're actually going to be using an injured muscle and the probability of a higher level of injury or a more drastic injury is greatly increased after sort of this classic stretch where you sit down and you just go through a range of motion to a point of, of discomfort or a point of pain. Now exercise fuel, or I'm sorry, uh, flexibility or stretching rather feels enjoyable for a lot of people and they say, oh I love to stretch because it makes my muscles feel so good. And the reason that it feels so good is because to cover up the pain that's being created, we release cocaine-like analogs, naturally occurring pain modulators such as enkephalins and endorphins to cover up the fact that we're creating pain. So those molecules are released into the bloodstream, they interact with the nervous system to cover up the fact that you actually are damaging the tissue, just like with a other painful stimuli or injury-inducing stimuli. So we want to avoid stretching, and we want to do some techniques here, and we're going to talk about those techniques here in, in just a few minutes. But we're talking about going through a range of motion in a way in which we engage the nervous system. And we're not just trying to simply focus on the skeletal muscle itself, but engage the nervous system to help increase the curve that I was just showing. I'll go back here. This curve here, increase the distance of this curve so that this portion of the curve moves further here to the right. So frequency, we're looking at two to three days per week for intensity. The intensity is going to start out with minor tension that's going to be reset through contraction. We'll come back and we'll talk more about that in just a second. I know that's kind of amorphous at this point, but it'll make sense here in just a moment. So you're going to go to minor tension and then you're going to reset that tension with a small amount of contraction, holding the position, the final position that was achieved during the, uh, that, that minor, minor tension. For time, we typically want to hold a flexibility exercise for 10 to 30 seconds of total time. If you go for more than 60 seconds, this increases the damage, increases the uh, likelihood that uh, during athletics or during sports that you're going to have uh, a higher rate of injury. Uh, also reduces muscle force and athletic um, ability. So hold for 10 to 30 seconds. 60 or more seconds is going to be problematic. 
want to complete four repetitions per exercise. And then provide yourself 30 to 60 seconds of rest between each of those repetitions. All right, so all of this has led up to this point here, and that's talking about the types of flexibility exercises that you can perform. And I'm going to give you two different li lists. I'm going to give you a list of exercises never to perform, and I'm going to give you a list of exercises to perform. Now most of you, and you may do this on a frequent basis, are already probably engaging in what's called static stretching. And this is going to be on our list of things to never do. This is that type of stretching where you have slow progression through the stretch to tension. And typically you try to go as far as you can before it becomes too painful and then you hold it at that point. Static stretching increases the amount of muscle injury that is experienced by the muscle, and this reduces all different types of characteristics for that muscle and increases the potential for injury. Another type of stretching is called ballistic stretching. Ballistic stretching has not been very common at all for quite a while. This is a sudden bouncy stretch. And it actually causes the same type of injury that we observe with static stretching. So a lot of you are probably already engaged in static stretching, especially if you're uh, involved in some sort of athletic team or athletic program. And this is a detrimental type of flexibility training. So what should we do? So what's going to be on the always perform list? The always perform list has just a single exercise. And that single effort exercise is called proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. So proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation or you can refer to it by its acronym, which is going to just simply be PNF, Proprioceptive Neuromuscular Facilitation. Now remember, at the beginning of this lecture, I mentioned that flexibility is regulated by the nervous system. So this technique is going to engage the, neural system, the neurological system. It's going to engage the nervous system and the muscular system, and it's going to facilitate this process is developing flexibility. So what we do is we utilize in this technique the neuromuscular reflexes to optimize increases in range of motion while reducing the potential for damage. So we're going to utilize neuromuscular reflexes to optimize an increase in range of motion to improve flexibility, but also reduce tissue damage. So to apply this technique, and you actually can go on YouTube and you can type in proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, and you can get videos that will show you how this technique is done. So what you'll do is you'll stretch or you'll move through a range of motion for a joint to a point of very mild, slight discomfort. So what this does is this begins to 
lengthen the muscle, lengthen the joint, but it does not induce damage because you're just going to that first point of discomfort, that mild discomfort. Then you're going to follow this up, keeping in that same position, so you may need a partner here. So you move through to that mild slight discomfort and then immediately contract. Now what the contraction does is it sends a signal back to the nervous system. So this is where we're engaging the nervous system. It sends a signal back into the nervous system and it says to the nervous system, that signal says the muscle has contracted, it's back to a normal length and a normal position. So we're sort of tricking the nervous system to think that we've actually gone back out of our stretch and that we're no longer stretching even though we've been holding in that same position. And then you'll repeat. So now you move that joint or that muscle further. You go for another, go to another point of mild or slight discomfort and you'll contract again. And then repeat that process one more time. So do this three times and you'll get to a point where you have moved that joint through a very large amount of its range of motion. You're increasing the overall range of motion, increasing that dynamic range by moving the point of injury here on this curve towards the right. Now there's two ways in which you can approach the PNF style exercise. You can approach this from a passive perspective, which simply means you're going to have an outside force. Typically, it's a friend. It helps to move the joint through its range of motion. And then that outside force is used to go through the next step, uh, so to speak, uh, for the proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. The other option or the other approach is an active approach. In which the individual themselves contracts an opposite muscle. So by going through this sequence of stretching to a point of, of very mild tension or discomfort and contracting, resetting the uh, nervous systems, uh, the nervous systems response on where the, the muscle is positioned and located, you can move the muscle through a much larger portion of the curve and you reduce the effects or the possibility rather of the fiber becoming brittle and rupturing. You move this curve towards the right, increasing the amount of length that that muscle can move through on its range of motion. And then when you're doing sports related activities or exercise, you have a bigger dynamic range from this portion of the curve to a longer portion of the curve over here where you, in which you can, can move those muscles uh, through their range of motion.